Um, hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of our Novage webinar series. Um, today, what's new in Keyshot 6? In this webinar, we'll go through the new features and enhancement you can find in Keyshot 6. From the geometry editor to the material graph, we'll cover updates to the software that make it even more powerful and easy to use. Today's presenter, Richard Funnel, is an award-winning industrial designer responsible for customer training and luxury makers of Keyshot. He has worked with customers rendering everything from private aircraft interiors to consumer electronics. Wow. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do in Novage. Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. So um, come visit us at Novage.com and also um, check out our Novage um, Facebook and Twitter account for great software news and um, specials and promos and don't forget to follow uh, more webinars in our series next week. Move to being with free training. What? Yes, you better believe me. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and it's being recorded. So if you want to watch this or any, any other webinar episode, just head on over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channel. And now uh, I will uh, transition to um, Richard's screen so he can start his presentation. Okay, perfect. Okay, Richard. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Well, um, so my name is Richard Fennell, and I'll be going through a workflow today with Keyshot 6. So thank you for dialing in. Uh, today we're going to be going through a workflow, everything from importing, working with materials, textures, lighting, uh, getting our scene all set up. And um, at the end we'll have some time for some Q&A, so feel free to ask questions if you have them. Uh, so Keyshot 6, we're currently at Keyshot 6.0, so that's the, the current release. Uh, what we'll do is we'll start off just by importing a model and then working through our materials. What I'll do is I'll just open up a folder here. The, the model that I'm going to be using is kind of a standard model. If you've seen some of uh, the Keyshot webinars, you may, you, you may recognize it. Um, but it's an NX assembly, so this one is going to have a full assembly st structure with all the parts and models that are within that assembly structure. So my window here that I've got open, this is Keyshot 6. Uh, I've got my library window on the left-hand side, project window on the right-hand side. I also went into full screen mode. I did that just by hitting the F key. Uh, I'll use some hotkeys while we're working. If you ever want a reminder of what the hotkeys are, you can always just hit the K key on your keyboard and it'll pop up with a list of all the hotkeys that are used in Keyshot. So I'll have those. Um, again, uh, as I use them, I'll try to call them out, but you can always do that to have a reminder brought up. Uh, actually, before we import a model, just a couple of quick things. We've made some changes in Keyshot 6, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about performance. Keyshot is a progressive render. It's based off of your CPU, so while you're working, it, the image is going to constantly improve and be refined. Uh, if you've used Keyshot for a while, though, you may have noticed that if you try to do Keyshot and use anything else, everything else can get slowed down. So what we can do, if you notice here in the top left, we have a drop-down that we can define the CPU usage. Basically, this is a virtual machine, so I've got 15 cores available. If I drop that down to a smaller number, uh, then Keyshot's going to work a little nicer with everything else on my computer. The other thing we can also do is pause key shot. So that's this little icon right here. Hot key for that is shift P. So if you hit shift in the letter uh, P, uh, then that's going to pause and unpause key shot in our real time view. So small things, but really handy if you've ever been bogged down while trying to do key shot and do anything else at the same time. So I'll generally pause key shot when I'm not using it so that I can go back into my model and make adjustments or work in Photoshop or Illustrator, or whatever else I'm doing. Um, I'll go ahead and unpause that. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and import a model. And so I'll go onto my desktop and I'll find the model that we'll be using. And I'm going to get the master assembly file here, which is this Keyshot camera part. And let's go ahead and open that and import that in a Keyshot. So generally all of these, all of these options are hidden, but I just wanted to take a, a quick second to talk about some of the import options that we have here. 
uh, location, pretty self-explanatory, but if you click center and snap to ground, that'll center the geometry and snap it to the ground. Up orientation, up is defined differently in different 3D packages. So if you ever import a model and it's coming in sideways, you can try toggling between usually Y and Z. Um, materials and structure, this is one thing that has changed a little bit uh, going from Keyshot 5 to Keyshot 6. Uh, grouping by object is what you've always done if you, you're importing models from Pro-E, uh, SolidWorks, any of kind of the CAD modelers. What's new is that there's now automatic material grouping. So if, if the parts are the same color, regardless of where they are in your model hierarchy, they're all going to share a, uh, the same linked material. So that's new, and I'll show you what that actually looks like. Um, but that's one change that was made from 5 to 6. Uh, another change made in 6 is there is no longer a scale import setting. We now respect whatever your scale is when you modeled your part. If you've ever imported multiple models into Keyshot and wondered why they were different sizes, huge or tiny and rotated 90 degrees and some axis, uh, that is now no longer an issue. We'll respect whatever your original modeling units are every time you import a part into Keyshot. Uh, lastly, down here, depending on the type of model you'll bring in, we have a tessellation quality slider. So the, an NX model will allow me to do this. So will all of our kind of CAD modelers, for example, SolidWorks, Pro-E, uh, CATIA. So if you're working with non-tessellated data, a NURBS modeler, we can, we can bring it in, our model, it'll get tessellated, and then if we realize after the fact that it's not high quality enough, we can adjust the tessellation as needed. Um, we also added the ability to import NURBS data. So if I hit that import NURBS data, I can also render from my pure geometry. Instead of a tessellated version, it'll be all my nice curves and lofts and um, the actual geometry itself. Downside is it's a little bit slower. But really quickly, I wanted to talk about a few, a few things on the import. Um, one of the most important ones is not having to worry about scale. So let's go ahead and import this model and see how it comes in. This model was made in NX and then it was prepared kind of in advance, planning for it, uh, by assigning colors to materials that were going to be shared in the model itself. So if you look at my model here, you'll notice that the model has a bunch of different colors on it and basically that way, I'm already planning on linking materials when I'm within my 3D modeling space. So, for example, what that means is here you'll see that I've got some blue parts, and that blue color was assigned in NX in this case. So if I go over to my metals folder and I go to the anodized rough folder and I grab a material and drag it over, you'll see that all of those parts are automatically linked by default. And those parts are all part of an assembly. And so you'll see here that they're over on the right hand side. I've got all these different parts in my assembly structure. Before you had to go in and copy and paste a linked material, uh, but now stick with the same color on everything and it will by default link them. So small mention there. Uh, a few other things that have changed. So I'll apply a, a material onto this part that kind of ring around my camera. Um, in the scene tree, the scene tree will respect whatever your scene hierarchy was from your model. Uh, one thing that has changed is the ability to, let's say if I select a part here, um, let's say this particular part I wasn't ever going to need. So if I hide that part, you'll notice that I can, uh, that part is now invisible, it's not being rendered, uh, but previously if I right clicked and hit show all parts, that part would come back. But let's say this part right here I actually don't want to have in my scene. New for the scene tree that we can do now is we can now hide and lock parts. So let's say I need that from my CAD standpoint, but I don't need it for this view. Now if I assign a material here, I'll get a glass material and I'll apply it to my set of lenses here. But now if I right click and hit show all parts, that other part doesn't pop up. Why? Because I've locked it. So you'll notice that that little icon here, the little lock icon is applied to that part. So what I could do is unlock it. And now if I click the little checkbox to bring it back, there it is with that material, the default material. It also didn't change the material because it was locked. So locking parts is a new addition. Well, I'm really happy about that. Uh, another new addition is a redesign move tool. So if I select these parts here, 
uh, I can go into the position tab and if I want to reposition this in my scene I can hit the move tool button now you'll notice that our move tool has been redesigned so if you're used to an older move tool or the previous Keyshot 5 move tool you'll notice that we can now enable and disable things that we don't want to do for example, if you don't want to scale the rotate, all you want to do is translate or move this in a linear fashion. You can disable those other options. So that's really nice. That's one thing. It's, it's just a redesign of the tool to make it a little bit easier to use. Another thing we added to the move tool, if I select the part, let's say, for example, this part right here, I could also right click and hit move part. And let's say I wanted to rotate this part. So I'll enable the rotation. And you'll notice that what it does is it tries to rotate around that object's center. So that's been the default. And the only way you could do that was, or the, the only way you could rotate around another object was to use the animation tool. Now you'll notice that we've added a line for a pivot. So the pivot says self. So it's orbiting around its own center. Now what I could do is just click on pick. And then I can either select the part here in my my selection window or you can actually just click and drag in your real-time view and if I select the part and then hit OK now you'll notice that my move tool snaps to the center of that object so now I can rotate a part around another part not totally groundbreaking but for some of you who have had a workflow where you need to have it to have a part rotate or move or a pivot or a door uh, this is going to be really really helpful uh, I won't apply that that rotation but working with the move tool and pivot points, but that's another addition we made to our scene tree over on the right hand side. So let's uh, let's talk about materials. And one thing you'll notice while we're working, Keyshot gets this kind of grainy appearance and it gets that because it's calculating our shadows and our materials and rebounces and things like that. One thing we can do to help kind of speed this workflow up is enable what's called performance mode. So up in the top left, there's this little P icon. If I click on that, that's going to turn down my render settings. As you notice, I can't see the, through the glass anymore, but it disables my shadows, global illumination, lights, uh, so that I can navigate through the scene a little bit easier and a little bit faster depending on the complexity of my model. A uh, hotkey for that is Alt-P. I jump in and out of performance mode all the time. Uh, you can tell that performance mode is on because that little icon goes blue. So just another thing to kind of help out with performance in your scene. While I'm moving around, I'm just using the mouse to click and drag, scroll wheel, zoom in and out, middle mouse button to uh, pan the camera. Another really handy thing is to right click anywhere on your model and then you can select look at. And when you click on look at, now the camera will actually pivot around your object wherever you select it. So it's an easy way to zoom in on something. For example, this little screw right here. Um, or if I wanted to look at this screw, I could right click, hit look at, and then now when I zoom, the camera is going to snap to that object. Then I can go in, apply some material to it, like this polished chrome, right? And now I know I hit exactly the material I wanted to hit. Okay, so the camera is now locked to rotating around that part. If you want to change it, right click anywhere on your model, and now I can just select look at model center. And that changes my camera pivot point to be the default, which is the center of that piece of geometry. So a small thing as far as camera control, but really helpful. So performance mode and knowing about your pivot point or your look at point. Okay, so let's apply a couple other materials. As you can see, when I applied that chrome material to all of those parts, they were linked, so they all became chrome. Um, let's apply uh, a leather material. So I'll go into my library here, go into the cloth and leather folder, and just get a black leather and apply that there. Oops, not a perforated leather. I'll just get a basic black leather and apply it onto that part. Um, okay, so let's talk about another new feature in Keyshot 6. It is the ability to break out pieces of geometry. So if I select this single part right here and I right click and I say show only, I'm just showing that one part. And what you'll notice is that this is a single piece of geometry and it's got a chamfer along the edges of this button. Well, let's say this button was actually going to be kind of a rough finish and only the chamfer itself was that nice polished finish. Uh, previously what you'd have to do is go back into your modeling software, select this set of faces, and then change the color. Then when you imported it into Keyshot, 
uh, it would know that that's a separate piece of geometry. New for six is the ability to select any piece of geometry. Now I can right click and I can hit edit geometry. This is a pro feature, so if this is uh, if you're working with a pro license, you'll have access to this. But now when I hit edit geometry, it's going to tell me that my nerves and triangles are no longer linked, and also that editing will break either the plugins or live linking. Uh, but what that gives me, if you'll notice here on the left hand side, I have this geometry view. It gives me a secondary viewport where I can now make changes to my geometry. This is totally new. So what can we do with this tool? A few things. We can split surfaces, which is what we're going to want to do. We're going to select a surface and then break that out as a separate piece of geometry. We can also split objects, so we can make multiple objects out of a single uh, layer or shader, uh, depending on how you're working. We can also edit normals and close mesh, so we can do some basic that's the 3D data. We'll go with split surfaces. So I'll hit next, and when I do that, you'll see that I now have this dialog box, and it's uh, asking me for a splitting angle. What does that mean? And some polygons. So what is all this stuff? Well, what we've done is we've made it so that now I can just click on some surfaces here in under my geometry view, and if I click, you'll see that it will make selections of polygons because this is a bunch of triangles. So I, if I select that bottom face, it sees this as one big flat surface. Uh, and if I wanted to break that out as a separate piece of geometry, I could just hit split object. What I want to do is break out that chamfer though. So I'll select the chamfer, but if you notice, that chamfer is also attached to my other surfaces. Well, the way we can get control over our surfaces is this splitting angle. I'll decrease the splitting angle. And if you notice, when I start decreasing it and getting smaller values, I've now isolated that specific layer. So now with this splitting angle of 33, so that means that chamfer angle was probably about in that range, uh, I could select that chamfer, hit split object, and now it actually sees that as a separate piece of geometry. Okay, I could also do that for this chamfer right here, select split object, and now I have a second chamfer. So you can start splitting out, out all your individual surfaces. You can also combine surfaces. So if I hold down shift, multi-select these two surfaces and then hit merge selection, now those chamfers are gonna be a single piece of geometry and then I can apply my material. The left-hand side, we're mirroring the camera movements, but we actually haven't defined this as uh, an action yet. So we haven't split this body yet. When I hit done though, it will do that. So now I hit done. Now if I look in my real-time view, I have multiple pieces of geometry. So there's that chamfer that I can enable or disable. Here's my regular chrome. So for my regular chrome, I can double click on it, add in a little bit of roughness. Right, so now I've got kind of a rough chrome um, and then I have that polished chamfer and you can still see that that's being mirrored in the geometry view. I'll go ahead and close geometry view, just click that little X, right? But that functionality is new for six, the ability to break out geometry or separate faces. I'll right click, hit show all parts, and now I have my model back. So the ability to modify geometry is new, that's a Keyshot 6 Pro feature, uh, but it's something that people have been asking for for a while. Uh, the materials, we've updated some materials in the material library. Um, we'll get into those a little bit later. I do want to mention the fact that we have an icon down here, which not many people click on, but it is good to know. On the bottom left, there is a cloud library. So what does that icon mean? It used to be called Keyshot Cloud. If I click on it, I'll get a web browser that pops open. And uh, in this case, I have an account, so it remembers that. Uh, if you've never worked with the cloud before, all you have to do is hit the register button and then get a free Keyshot Cloud account. Okay, so what is a Keyshot Cloud? Well, let me go ahead and log in. And when I log in, you'll see that this is where we put more of our assets online for free. Materials, uh, backplates, textures, and environments. The question I get asked a lot is, hey, where can I get more environments? Well, this is a great resource for getting more environments. Uh, let's say I was going to do, a, you know, I needed 
Um, a bathroom, there's a great example. Here's a bathroom environment. I was designing some sort of um, consumer product that goes into a bathroom. Well, now I can just hit download, download this environment to my library. So if you haven't looked at this before, the Keyshot Cloud, or what is now called the Cloud Library is awesome. And you'll see here we've got over 1,300 assets. So we have more materials, um, textures, all sorts of assets, uh, including our partner assets. So for example, if I type in Moldtech, if you work with Moldtech textures, and you were all, if you ever wondered why we only had five Moldtech textures here in the library, well, if I go back, you'll see this is the full Moldtech library. So the 11,000 series is one that's really popular. So here's Moldtech 11,010. I can select it, hit download, uh, and then this is going to download and you'll see over here on the left-hand side, it's getting downloaded into my materials folder in the downloads uh, subdirectory there. So if you haven't messed with the cloud, the cloud is awesome. It's free. You can download these assets, save them to your library, make adjustments, do whatever you want with these, use them on your projects. So that's downloading. Also quickly want to mention, because the Moltec will take advantage of it, when we imported our models, uh, you'll notice here that under units, it says millimeter. So Historically, Keyshot has not, by default, respected your units. Now, what this means with millimeters automatically being detected is that if I take this mold tech texture, apply it to my part, you'll see you don't need to mess with the scale on that mold tech material. It is a one-to-one -one representation of that mold tech material. Uh, yeah, so cloud library, definitely take advantage of that. There's a lot of good stuff. Uh, I'll keep on applying a couple of materials. So let's say this glass on the back. Um, I'll get outer performance mode so we can see a little bit more detail. But let's say you want to work with multiple materials in your scene, or I just want to copy and paste this material. Something you can do is you could right click on any piece of geometry and I can hit copy material. Now if I rotate my camera and I'm looking at this piece of glass on the back, I could right click and I could paste a linked material. When I do that, it's going to apply the same material to both of those parts. If you like hotkeys, and I love hotkeys, uh, let's say we were going to apply uh, a hard, shiny plastic. So this black plastic right here. And this same plastic was also going to go on these parts on the back. What I could do is instead of right-clicking and copying, if I, you just hold this shift button on your keyboard and left-click, that's the equivalent of copy. Now if I rotate my camera around, hold down shift, and then right click, that's the equivalent of paste linked material. So now I have the same material applied to those two parts. So shift left click is copy, shift right click is paste linked material. I have some parts under this lens right here. Uh, if I uncheck that, then I'll be able to apply materials. So I'll just get a rough black plastic and apply that to that part right there. Um, this little LED ring, let's go to the miscellaneous folder. There's some great materials in here, like a flat material. So I could just take a flat gray, apply it to that part right there, and the flat material doesn't receive shadows or reflections, it's just color. Um, that'll be good to kind of give, you know, give an idea of like a light without having to work with the physical lights. Uh, one thing to also keep in mind is we're messing with the colors library, or excuse me, we're messing with the materials library, there's also a color library. Uh, what this means is that colors are actually independent of our materials. So let's say on this material, uh, my Moltec, I could right click and hit edit material and that shows me the material properties. You can also do the same thing by double clicking. So if I double click on this uh, blue metal, you'll see that that brings up the material editing window. So these are two dissimilar materials. What I can do is I could go into my color library and I can select a color. Uh, for example, Pantone colors. If you work with Pantone or RAL colors, it's really good to know that you can actually just grab a Pantone color and I'll get something that's not blue. And if I just grab some color or you can also search as well. So if I type in red, this is gonna search through my Pantones for all the red Pantones and I can make those icons a little bit bigger. Uh, but for example, here's this Pantone Red 32C. I can drag that color onto a material. The material stays the same. Same thing for this Moltec, right? And now if you look at those materials, two different materials, but the colors are being referenced by this one Pantone color. 
if I go over to my material editing tab and I hold my mouse over that color well, uh, then you'll see that I get the rollover uh, preview of red 32C in the Pantone library. So different materials, but we're defining them using the same uh, color characteristic. Um, so I can go back to my basics and I'll just get a white and I'll drag it over onto that flat material. So always keep in mind that you have materials and you also have colors in your library. If you're working with known colors, if you have brand colors or something like that, then you can always just drag those over, create your own custom color libraries to work with in the future. Okay, so colors. Uh, let's right click an empty space. I'll hit show all parts. Now we get our glass back or our outer lens there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about textures. Because if you look at some of these materials, for example, our mold tech materials, and I let that sit for just a second, you'll notice that there's actually some textures on that part. This metal up here, I'll double click on it, you'll see that it's assigned by a color and roughness. So roughness is just as, uh, just as an explanation, roughness is not texture. So roughness, if I drop that down to zero on that material and I look at it, uh, you'll see with roughness of zero, I'm getting perfectly smooth reflections. Roughness is not texture. What roughness is, is actually randomizing the reflections. Think more of a matte finish or a satin finish. Instead of all the rays bouncing off our material at parallel angles, uh, this randomizes it. So I'll never actually get any texture, right? So if you look at this mold tech material, I really do have texture on my metal right here. Eventually that'll smooth out and I won't actually get any sort of texture in that surface. So what do we, what do, we do instead, right? Well, we can go under the textures tab and here's where I can start assigning textures. Uh, we, can, we can define a couple different types of textures uh, depending on the material. Uh, we can do things like, let's say for the color, um, we want to make this into some sort of other material, carpet or carbon fiber or something like that. Actually, what I'll do is I'll work with this mold tech material and let's start this from scratch, but I'll just get a regular uh, glossy paint and I'll apply it to that part. So if I double click on this material, you'll see that I have some textures. Well, if I wanted to, let's say, recreate wood, I could go into the textures folder and it's reading my previews. This is a fresh new installation. So it's seeing these image textures. And what I could do is I could find a texture that I want to use. And you can also do this by looking for your own image textures. You can go into an online image search. And if you were to type in carbon fiber texture or carpet texture, you can download any sort of file that's a, you know, a JPEG, PNG, and then you can apply it to the material. So something like this, I'll go into the wood textures. So this isn't a material. If I open that up, you'll see it's actually a texture. It's a JPEG, right? So this is a picture of walnut. But I, I could grab that, I could drag it over, I could apply it as a color texture, right? and you'll see that now my color has been replaced by the image. So that's not anything new for Keyshot 6, but it is worth mentioning. We can take any image and apply it as a color texture. If I grab that color texture and drag it over to Bump, take a look at the surface. What it does is it remembers the original material color, but now what a bump texture does is a bump texture changes the way the light bounces off the surface. So instead of it being a flat surface, just like the mold tech material, now we're actually adding texture onto our surface. So bump textures do that. The really important slider for bump textures is this slider here for bump height. This controls the difference between the peaks and valleys on the surface. Right, so now I have that wood as a bump texture, and if I bring it back over and apply that as color, you'll see that with the bump texture, I get more realism in the material. With it turned off, I just get a really flat material. So uh, this is probably going over stuff you may know, color textures and bump textures, but it's worth calling out. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention here with these textures is a feature that we have made some additions to, and it's a little bit hidden, um, but we have what are called procedural textures. So procedural textures are math-based textures. They're not image-based textures. But let's say I were to modify this red metal. I could double click on it. I can go to the textures tab. And right now I don't have any textures loaded. 
But what I can do, let's say we want to actually add a little bit of texture to this metal. Roughness isn't texture. So what we can do is we can go to the bump texture. If I select it, I can now use the drop down to apply a new uh, bump texture to this material. These are not image-based textures. These are math-based textures. So let's try using something like a noise texture. And if you look at that surface, now I get this nice kind of noisy pattern. What's really cool about that is if I zoom in way super close, you'll notice I don't get any pixelation issues. So these are going to be math-based. They're going to wrap around your entire piece of geometry. So I could scale that down and I can increase the bump height. But if you're ever trying to apply some kind of subtle textures, this is a great way to do it. Um, so yeah, now I have a really simple bump texture applied on that material. So procedural textures aren't necessarily new, but they're worth knowing about. We have lots and lots of different types of procedural textures, wood, leather, color gradients, occlusion textures, that's a new one for six uh, color, right? But there's a lot of really neat stuff hidden in here. And again, you get to these by modifying the material directly. You're not going to find them in the textures folder. Uh, we don't have enough time to get into all the different types of materials, uh, but I will mention that we have changed some of these materials a little bit. We've added some new materials for Keyshot 6. If you used Keyshot before, uh, you may notice that we've adjusted the order. So we have basic materials, we have advanced materials, our light source materials, and then special materials. So we've reorganized these a little bit. Um, our translucent advanced is a new material. We've made updates to our gem materials. We've, uh, we've done a lot of kind of small tweaks with the materials and some of the materials in the material library will reflect this. For example, plastic, we have uh, plastic and then we also, so under basic we have just a, a regular um, opaque plastic. We also have transparent plastic. So that's worth knowing. We've adjusted some of those materials in there so it's worth trying some things out. Um, one thing I do want to talk about just for the sake of time, I'll keep moving along, uh, with labels, labels we can think of those as kind of stickers or printing that we apply to a product. So if I navigate over to the project folder here, there's a label, so this artwork. So this little piece of artwork is going to go on the top of my camera. Um, so what I could do is just apply this to that material. So this was saved out as a PNG file. So it's an artwork file with transparency. So I'll grab this, I'll drag it over, and you can do this. If you've never done this before, you can just drag it directly into Keyshot, and I can apply that as a label. So now you'll notice I'm in position mode. So I can just click to position this wherever I want. So I'll just hit the little checkbox. And let's take a look at our mapping tools. But what this label is going to be is it's just going to be a graphic on top of my other material. Uh, another thing that's kind of hidden, if you're creating your own labels, I can just hit this little checkbox here that says DPI. So if I check that and I exported this artwork file and I saved it in the file name, 1600 DPI, that means if I type in the DPI value of 1600, I get a one-to-one -one representation of that artwork. So if you've never used that before, if like me, you were always typing in like 0.368 for your scale for a label, knowing that the DPI is there is really nice. So I'll, the position tool hasn't changed. I'll just get my artwork, click on position, and then try to position it somewhere close to where I want it. Uh, normal projection, which is how this labels being projected, does respect your camera angle. So I'll try to line my camera up as best I can and then hit position. And now I can click and drag to position that on my part. So there we go. We have that label. Completely new for six is the ability to actually add, or excuse me, apply a material to a label. So you'll notice that this label was added onto this metal part but the label itself is assigned a plastic material. So this is completely new. You can also change that. So now I can change this to a metal label. So that actually takes on the material properties of metal on a label. So this is totally new, which is really nice. What I can also is I can apply bump textures or opacity textures or anything else I want to these labels. Um, so let's say that was actually a raised label. Um, so it had a little bit of texture to it. Well, I could grab that same that same artwork, uh, and I can just drag it and apply it as a bump texture. Now, if you take a look at that material, 
it actually has a little bit of texture to it. Right? Oh, another way that you could do this is if you select uh, any texture, if you hold down Alt, it'll duplicate. But now if I take a look at that material, it actually has a bump texture to it. And like I mentioned before, knowing about this bump height slider is good. Now we can adjust the height of that texture. So let's type in something like 0.2. Usually I'll keep those values in the 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 range. But now we've not only assigned a material to our label, but we've also made it so that that label had a little bit of depth to it by applying a bump texture. So that's new functionality. It's really cool, uh, but the ability to apply materials to labels. Um, let's grab another label. So let's get something like our uh, this key shot icon, apply it as a label. You can see it's added to the labels drop down or the labels menu here. This one, I don't know the DPI, so I'll just scale this one manually, eyeball it, place it on my model. Uh, and let's say this was actually some sort of, um, there was some process to apply this, and you'll see right now it has a plastic material assigned to it, but it was actually more of a sticker on the surface that it picked up the bump texture. Well, if you take a look at the texture itself on that sticker, you'll notice that it doesn't pick up the texture on that plastic material. Well, if I go over to the bump texture for that label and I hit this little drop down, I can select from parent. So now this label will also take on the bump texture from the parent material. So that's some pretty cool stuff that we've added in there as far as being able to have more control over your materials and assign materials to labels. Um, one thing that is actually happening in the background while we're working on these materials is uh, we're creating a, a more complex material. It's a pro feature, but if you have Keyshot Pro, you get access to this button right here under my material tab called the material graph. And when I click on this, you'll see that I get a completely new window. This is a way of building a more complex material where you have a lot more control. Uh, what's really neat about this is that it's basically a node-based material editing system. You've got inputs and you've got outputs. Uh, you don't have to mess with this if you don't want to, but what's really cool is you can make a lot of changes to your materials and textures this way. We get a lot more control. We can add new nodes to our material graph, and we can add materials, we can add textures, we can add animation. Um, animation is now included in Keyshot Pro, so if you wanted to animate things like uh, colors, changing through multiple colorways, this is where we can make those additions and changes to our material. We can also add utility nodes. Um, for example, let's say I wanted this logo to be in a different color. Well, I can go to the utilities and I can find, uh, let's say, a color adjust node. Right. So what I can do is this texture map, Right. so that colored texture is defining that plastic material which goes onto the metal material. So everything is going from the left hand side over to the right. What I'll do is I'll make it so that this texture map and I can grab this little endpoint and I can push it through the color adjust node so that now I can adjust the color of that node. So if I double click on color adjust and let me bring this back so you can see it, I now have sliders for hue, for saturation, for value. And so what I'll do, let's say we're gonna change the color on this, uh, on this texture. Well, I could grab the hue slider. And now when I start sliding that, I can adjust the hue of that label, um, which is pretty cool. This is completely new functionality for us. So this material graph, there's a lot you can do here. You can add multiple bump maps. You can start working with color compositing. Like I mentioned, animated uh, material changes, so color changes or value changes. There's a lot you can do with the material graph. Um, but that's a pro feature, and that gives you so, so much more control over your materials. Um, so perfect. So yeah, that's the material graph and how you can work with those materials. Let me see how we're doing on time. We've got about five minutes left, so I'll cruise through some of our other content. Um, environments, we've added some new lighting environments to our library. So if I go over to the environments tab here, you'll notice Dosh Design, we've partnered with them to provide some more lighting environments. So if I drag those over, you can see my lighting characteristics change because I'm working with a totally different environment. Uh, again, you can always get more environments in the cloud library as well. 
but take a look through here because we definitely have added some. Uh, a pro feature that not everyone is aware of is the ability to modify existing environments and create new ones from scratch. So that's the functionality here within the HDRI editor. Uh, to show you an example of that, let's go ahead and get an interior scene and I'll drag this over, apply it, and hit this little button right here that says HDRI editor. Well, if I click on that, I get a new window that pops up and this is our environment editor. What this allows me to do is make changes and make new environments. Uh, for example, this scene right here. Uh, it's got a lot of warmth in the scene, so I'm getting a lot of reds and oranges. Also, the reflections are just too busy. So I can go into my environment editor and with a few tweaks, for example, cutting down on the saturation or blurring my environment, I can still get a realistic lighting scenario, uh, but one that doesn't actually detract from the appearance of the model itself and the materials. So instead of trying to change my materials to get rid of reflections, for example, uh, I can just change the environment so that I don't have to worry about those kind of reflections. So if you haven't messed with this, uh, the environment editor is awesome. Uh, we can also, if I go to the pins tab, we can use tools like the set highlight tool. So let's say I wanted a specific highlight. Uh, let's say on this part right here, on this right side, for whatever reason, I wanted to add a highlight. Well, I could click set highlight, and if I do that, I get a dialog that says control, click adds highlight. So if I hold control, click on my model, now I get a highlight right there. Or if I wanted another highlight right here on my lens, I just click and now I get a highlight. What's cool about these is that they're all adjustable lights. You can change the individual brightness of a light. Uh, pin two, I can, let's say, change the color. So if we want to add some color, now that's a red light or it's a blue light or it's a greenish light. Right? So we can make all kinds of changes to these. We can change the shape. Uh, 6.1, which is in testing right now, we'll be able to actually add half pins, so, you know, half spheres and things like that makes gradients uh, a lot easier. But this is new functionality, as is the ability to add, um, add an image pin. So what does that mean? I can actually find some sort of image. Uh, so I'll find, um, let's see, do I have any images? Here we go. I can find some other image, and these are examples of renderings done in Keyshot 6. Uh, so let's find something like this one. This is just uh, this is uh, actually another rendering, so I'll select it. But what I could do is I can actually add that image to my existing environment, and I'll disable this other light so that we can see it a little bit easier. But if I select that image and click Set Highlight Tool, and now move it around. You'll actually, you, you can actually see on my, on my model that it's reflecting that image that I've added. So there's a reflection of that image. Uh, there's a ton of functionality in here. Um, I just want to at least briefly mention it, but yeah, you can adjust existing environments. You can create your new ones from scratch. You can also create sun and sky uh, scenarios. So for example, you know, if we wanted to recreate the lighting um, in St. Petersburg, uh, in March at, you know, 1.46 in the afternoon, we can actually generate a sun-sky system based off of that information. Um, so that's the environment editor. I'll change back to a default environment just so it's not as distracting, and you'll notice that I get this dialog that says, hey, you were editing an environment. What do you want to do? I'll just discard. But I do want to mention here under our lighting tab, this is a completely new tab. So these are some of the things that used to exist under the settings tab. But we, what we did is we created lighting presets. So performance mode, here's where you can find performance mode. Strip down lighting settings so that's a little bit faster. Uh, basic, which is the default. We have product, which enables global illumination and ups your ray bounces. We also have an interior rendering mode. Uh, if I check that to interior, my product's going to look a little bit different. The scene isn't necessarily optimized for that, but it is a brand new lighting algorithm for working with uh, scenes that have a lot of indirect lighting and physical lights. Uh, but what this is actually doing is it's toggling on and off certain settings, it's adjusting ray bounces, shadow quality, things like that. Um, but this allows you to 
really nail down the lighting that's best for your products. And then let's say for my products, if I'm working with a lot of transparent layers, you know, I need 16 ray bounces. We won't see much effect here, but let's say we also need three indirect bounces and I want ground illumination turned off. So these are the settings I want for my product. In this case, to be a product with a lot of transparent layers. Well, I could add a new lighting profile. So if changing these settings is something that you do, you can work with your own custom lighting profile. So I'll call this um, clear products, right? So now when I hit OK and I use my drop down, you'll see I have clear products. So anytime I open Keyshot, these profiles are going to be there. They're going to be remembered. That's new functionality. Uh, under the camera tab, we haven't added too, too much. One cool new thing that we did add in Keyshot 6, um, we have perspective lenses. We have orthographic lenses, right? I think this makes everybody kind of cringe. We see the world in perspective. Right, and CAD, you see it in orthographic mode. Another thing that we added is a shift lens. Those of you who are doing architecture or uh, really rectilinear products may appreciate this, uh, but what a shift lens does is here, using just regular perspective, you'll notice that my vertical lines are converging down. What we see is three-point perspective, right? So these lines are going to the left, these lines are going to the right, and our verticals are not actually vertical, they're converging down unless I just hit the shift button, and there's a button here that says estimate vertical shift. If I do that, you'll notice all of my lines go parallel, right? And now I can just adjust where my camera is positioned using the vertical shift slider. Um, this looks a little bit weird for this scale of product, but if I were rendering, say, an, an entire city block, this is a really, really great way of controlling uh, the shift on your lens. So that's a new addition as well. We've added a lot of functionality in the Keyshot 6, so uh, if you have any questions, we've got a little bit of time to cover those. Uh, otherwise, take a look on our website to see some of the new features, and I'll pull up some images, some examples of some other work done in Keyshot 6. This is all just from the last few weeks of what I've seen on our forum. If you ever uh, want to find some inspiration, our forum is a great place to look. So here are some cool images from the Keyshot forum. Um, but yeah, any questions so far? Hi, Richard. Um, so no, the questions were mostly about pricing and upgrades. And so I want to encourage everybody to email at calvin at noveg.com because, uh, you know, it's pretty cool and easy to shop from Noveg. You go and it's a very intuitive and you know, fast process, but the best thing is that you can actually talk to somebody and um, we have great experts that will help you with any problem with transition and um, uh, um, make it fit and workflow. So um, give us a call or shoot us an email, calvin and novage.com. Um, the other thing, I also wanted to mention that there's some, um, this, first of all, thank you, Richard, because this was amazing and um, it's good to see what you can do with Keyshot and often we interview artists or architects and people that really use Keyshot and do amazing things like recently in our blog we interviewed this um, architect that does architecture rendering so um, just check it out on the veg blog and you can see actually um, an example in practice of you know the work that can be done using Keyshot and you just add your talent and um, it's pretty easy um, and uh, we have one question now uh, does Keyshot work, work with displacements um, no Keyshot does not support displacements we have a couple different map types so we can do diffuse or color textures we can do bump normal specular and opacity and that does depend on the material type but currently we don't support displacement Okay, hope that an so that answered the question. Uh, anything else? Uh, we'll leave you a couple of seconds to you know for last minute concerns. Okay, no, just thank you, and um, so I will thank you too, Richard. Um, uh, this was really helpful, and um, I think people will run hopefully to our website to get the new version. It seems uh, very exciting, and uh, I will take the screen back and um, say my goodbye. Let's see, hopefully you can see my screen now. I want to thank everybody for attending and I want to remind everyone to visit our Novage uh, page 
at Novage.com where you can find the new Keyshot 6 in all its version. Novage is the best way to buy design software online. And for information on latest specials and releases, join the Novage Network on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter. And check out the Novage blog for our interview with the uh, artists of all kind of disciplines and um, to see the way they use their favorite design tools. And don't forget the next week's webinar is about uh, the move to BIM and uh, there's free training in the picture so check it out and to rewatch today's webinar or previous ones check out the Novage YouTube or Vimeo channels our webinar playlist as webinars for every software taste thanks again for joining us have a wonderful day and thank you Richard for a flawless presentation thank you very much bye bye, bye.